You in a hotel, Ryan? Yeah, yeah, I'm in St. Jean right now. Oh, cool. Yeah. Becky flew home. She's in Victoria very soon. Here for a four-week course starting Monday. Oh, I see. Yeah. So I got an extra night in the hotel, so I figured, hey, I'm going to record. I'm recording with you and then Craig right after. <laughs> oh, fair enough. So I guess the hotel Wi-Fi is good enough. I might not be doing live anymore. It just won't might not work unless I'm in person with like I do with Ruben. But now that I'm going to be gone for the next three to four years, I might just be back to streaming. Then I'll uh, broadcast the audio live, if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. Like a, like a yeah. you know, people can still interact, but it won't be us talking with them. I, I was listening on the plane to a bunch of I was catching up on the Rocky Five ones, you guys. Oh, I've watched them all now. Yeah, so we won't be doing those next to each other's anymore for a while because I get home from the course and I drive away a week later with the family. So it's bing, bang, boom. Is the military moving all your stuff and you're just driving just yourselves to Quebec or do you have to drive all your <coughs> stuff as well? No, they do everything. They literally pack your house, pack the mm-hmm. truck, like everything. And the cleaning, okay. gets, the cleaning gets paid for. We bought a new house here. We're renting out the house that we bought in Victoria. Uh, oh, great. They pay for the broker fees. They paid for the inspection. They pay for everything. Oh, good. Well, I guess if they expect you to move across the country, they have to make it reasonable for you. Yeah, yeah and they paid for, of course, my hotel, food. Uh, they won't pay for, like, the $300 in pornographic videos you're going to charge on. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell the uh, hotel staff to market under coffee or something. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Welcome, everyone, to another episode of Going the Distance, the Rocky Series podcast. I am your host, Ryan, and with me today, we have a special guest host again, Mr. Kyle Peterson. How you doing? Doing great. Thanks for having me on twice in a row. Yeah, it's great having you on. And my listeners who are listening to this episode, last episode, I had an interview with John Rivoli, and I said in that prelude before that episode started that I wouldn't have any other shows coming up for four to six weeks <laughs> well i lie. No, i didn't lie but uh it turns out that i have an extra night in the hotel uh some extra time allotted that i didn't know i'd have and the wi-fi is not too bad so i'm like you know what i'm gonna call up a couple buddies you and i think craig's gonna come on after you and the show must go on but after these two recordings for my listeners there might be a bit of a break is what we're getting at so welcome everyone to the show kyle you ready to go further into rocky five yeah, just no cheap shots, all right? Yeah, no cheap shots. We'll move it around. <laughs> for our listeners, I don't know anyone who's listening to this episode for the first time who hasn't heard any other episodes, but if you are, <laughs> we're covering Rocky Five, Season 5, and we're going in order of the movie, and we've just uh, finished the part of the film in Rocky Five in our last episode with Kyle where Tommy Gunn showed his stuff in the ring, in the sparring ring in front of Polly. And Rocky and Polly said he stinks of opportunity. Tommy Gunn stinks of opportunity. Rocky sees a dangerous person in the ring. Maybe somebody he doesn't want to train. Tommy leaves the gym dejected. So that's where we left off. Anything you want to add before we start? No, that about covers it. Like I was saying in the last episode, it's kind of like the scene from the first movie where uh, Rocky and Mick had the confrontation and Rocky ended up walking out. So, you know, they're trying to mirror that there, which I think is pretty cool. Definitely this film does a lot of callbacks to the first couple films, for sure. That was the whole idea of this film, was to ground it and put it back to take us back, do-do-do-do, take us back. Yeah, I should love to do that. Uh, you do it. <laughs> uh, we've done it a few times. Anytime you say take me back or whatever, you have to yeah. do it. Let's hit play and see where we go here. All right. Move it around. So the scene that we have coming up here is we have Rocky Jr. walking dejected, his hands in his pocket, his backpack is over one shoulder. He got some smog or fog rolling in over him. (laughs) I think that's like from sewer vents and stuff. You see that in New York a lot. Okay. Uh, You see steam coming from the sewer vents. They're in South Philly, I guess. I don't know where the actual filming location is for this school. 
but I'm pretty sure that's what that is. Okay. And behind him is Jewel, the girlfriend of the two bullies that took his jacket. She was kind of surprised by how quickly things kind of got violent and out of hand. And looks like she's coming up on Robert here to, to talk to him, to maybe make some peace. So let's see their conversation here. How you doing? Cold? You look cold. I guess that has something to do with the weather. Here, take my coat. No, thanks. Where's your boyfriend? All right, so she says you look cold. <laughs> if I were him, I'd be like, yeah, no shit. You guys just took my coat. <laughs> like, <laughs> well, he kind of did hint at that. He goes, yeah, it must be the weather. Yeah, exactly. She's trying to show some empathy with him and, and recognize his situation. I could see him not knowing where she really stands on things, uh, seeing that as more of a like jab at him. Right. Yeah, you know, she's trying to be, here, Here, take my jacket. And I'm surprised she didn't say, here, take my jacket. It's worth, I don't know, 50, 60 bucks. <laughs> <laughs> Keep the coat. Keep the coat. You should have planned ahead, Jewel. You should have planned ahead. <laughs> oh, that would have been awesome. Can you imagine? Can you imagine him taking her coat, too? Well, that's just it. Not to be misogynistic here, but let's be honest. This is 1990. You know, he's a 14-year-old kid. You got a girl offering you her jacket. There's no boy in 1990 that would have ever taken the jacket. Well, there's no boy in 2019 who would do that. Maybe I'm wrong on that, but that's showing weakness, basically. And and you're going to wear a girl's coat around. That shouldn't matter, but I think to a lot most people it does. Right. And then he says, no thanks, where's your boyfriend? So let's hear her response to that. Him. Forget it. He ain't got no manners. I'm Jewel, if you want to know. I'm Robert. She says, forget that guy. He's got no manners. They got to move the story along, right? Like, they, it is kind of weird that. I guess they were dating. So quick, I guess it, it probably might have been a long time coming where that incident was like the straw that broke the camel's back or something. So I guess we are led to believe they were going out and she's because she didn't say, well, he wasn't my boyfriend. and We never did date. I always assumed that he was. And then she just kind of ditched him after that. So she introduced herself as Jewel, which I think is a unique name for 1990, quite frankly. There's the singer Jewel. I don't know if that's her real name. She became popular in the late 90s. Yeah. Yeah. I wonder what is her real name. That might actually be your name. I don't know. And I noticed here, too, in this scene, as soon as she introduces herself, he has his hand ready to go to shake her hand. Even though like she was part of this group that just screwed him over. Right. Uh, I think he's kind of desperate enough <laughs> for some some sort of ally or some sort of friend that I don't think he's going to hold a grudge for too long. Well, yeah, she's a girl. She's kind of cute. And yeah. he's probably anxious to have an ally. And what's the old saying? The enemy of my enemy is my friend. Yeah, exactly. Puts his hand out old fashioned style. I'm Robert. He introduced himself as Robert. Which also the handshaking thing might be from his background, like with like uh, wealthy kids and stuff. He probably went to a fancy school where they kind of taught him those kind of manners. Because it's like in school, you don't shake other kids' hands. Like that's very unusual. Regular public school, at least for me, it would have been. I shook hands, I think, back then, though. Really? To like just kids you met for the first time like, <sighs> in school? I think so. I don't know. Maybe I didn't, but I seem to think so. Maybe you went to a fancier school, Ryan. <laughs> yeah, I didn't go to no Philly. Yeah. And I like that she shakes his hand, and she shakes it pretty good. And he kind of looks at it and looks at her, and I, he seems taken aback by the handshake. Watch that again. Maybe she had a firm oh, handshake, Robert. too. Maybe she, like, half broke it. hand. <laughs> yeah, she shook it pretty good. And I, There's nothing worse than a bad handshake. So she actually took it into his hand and really d- did give it a good shake. I actually shook someone's hand yesterday. It was uh, the lady that was doing the inspection of our the new house that uh, Becky and I just bought here in Quebec. She shook our hands after the inspection was over, and it was like that weird shake where I'm basically just holding your hand. Like, you've put your hand out, but I'm the one grasping your hand and just kind of like, okay, I guess I'll just literally yeah. shake shake your dead fish hand. There's a couple things there. I think the, the similar background we have, if you know what I mean, the firm handshakes are really important. Some cultures, too, and people don't like the firm handshake. Hmm. And I know a lot of women, it depends. I'm not saying all of them. I know there's like a higher proportion of those type of handshakes come from women as well because 
I don't know. Maybe they don't want to be seen as aggressive or whatever. Hmm. So maybe that's why Robert was taken aback by that strong female handshake. Yeah. I'm pro strong female handshake. Me too. And Jewel, the singer, that is her uh, birth name. She, her name is Jewel Kilcher. Yeah. She lived in Alaska in a house with no plumbing. And she was actually born in Payson, Utah. She used to be uh, Mormon. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I didn't know that. So she goes on to explain that she's been living here for six where, years. Six years. Yeah. I would love to know what happened there. So they don't hint at all of what happened. Did she formerly come from a better area? I wonder if that's the hint. Maybe it's her way of saying, look, you know, I, I got here six years ago, so she would have been about eight years old. But she's probably saying, look, it was tough, too, when I got here. I understand what you're going through. It's a bit of a culture shock. She seems like she's kind of put together. Maybe her family wasn't really – maybe they just hit a hard time, too, so they kind of moved to a poor area. Like maybe she's got a single mom now or something like that. I was thinking single mom. Yeah. Yeah. Look at us giving a lot more credence and background to the problem this story deserves. But I wonder if they'll have a Jewel spinoff one day. That'd be awesome. Starring the <laughs> Today's Jewel. <laughs> yeah, let's we'll call her up in Massachusetts. Well, they almost could because Jewel is about the same age as the actress. Because Jewel was born – it's funny because she would have been – looked at her age. I think she's the same age as me and I'm the same age as Robert. So they could almost – Yeah, in the neighborhood there. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Well, I've been living here about six years now. <laughs> it ain't Disneyland. You've been to Disneyland? Sure. <laughs> you make it sound like everybody has. I know you can't tell by the way I look, but I ain't like the other kids around here. Why? I mean, what makes you so different? I don't know. I, I guess it's because I want to get out. You know how it is. Hmm, you know? For an Italian kid. You ain't got a bad butt. Shut up, man. Come on. A, f- a few things happen there. First, she explained that she does look different. I guess we're led to believe that she does indeed look different, that she's trying to set herself up as not a part of this kind of neighborhood. I think she said that you can't tell by the way she looks, mm. but that she is different. So I think she's saying that she looks like the people in there, but don't let that deceive you and that she wants to to get out of the the neighborhood and be something else. You also mentioned our last recording where she brought up Disneyland. Well, you got that scene now where she goes, oh, you make it sound like everyone's been there. It's funny. When I listened to this as a kid, like my family could never afford to go to Disneyland yeah. growing up. And so, <laughs> uh, yeah, I feel you. I'm not, <laughs> I've never been to Disneyland either, Jewel. Yeah. Yeah, well, Robert – had a very blessed life so like obviously she probably came from a better place but nowhere near where robert would have come from like she probably maybe came from like a middle class background and then ended up in a working class neighborhood yeah and i also think it's her way of saying that she recognizes that though robert is you know i guess almost penniless now compared to what he used to be but she kind of recognizes that here's a good looking well-to-do kid and robert she obviously sees that, and she doesn't want to be associated with the bums and the scam artists. And she's like, you know, just so you know, I, I'm not like the other kids. You know, we, you, you could get along with me. I, I, I kind of wouldn't mind being around a guy that's not a jerk. So good for, good for Jewel for not wanting to be with a jerk. She makes a comment about uh, Robert's buttocks. Yes. I. <laughs> sorry, say the last part again? His, gl- his glutes. Yeah. She uh, noticed uh, for an Italian – uh, which is uh, quite the qualifier, I guess. So that's the thing. For an Italian, you've got a pretty nice butt. Do you know, are Italians known th- not to having a nice derriere? Well, I don't know. What did Stallone's look like in the shower earlier? Like, it looked okay. Uh, <laughs> yeah, if we just go back and look at Tango and Cash or The Specialist or A Party of Kitty and Studs, we could probably get a... <laughs> Uh, yeah, I don't know what butt features and which, uh, which ethnicity has uh, the nicest butts. <laughs> She's, she's obviously quite forward. So, yeah. Like, why not? I got to figure she's probably done stuff with Chip. Maybe Chip was inadequate in the buns department. <laughs> the, the friendship's definitely budding here. For an Italian guy, you don't have a bad button. I guess uh, Robert's like, oh, man, I'm going to keep this girl. She's golden. Well, I love he checks his own butt out or tries to. Yeah, he tries to look at it. I, I would wait. Uh, I'd wait till you get home, look in the mirror. That's just me. Well, he's, he's a kid still. He needs to learn these lessons. That's true. So now we have an outdoor shot here of Mix, Mighty Mix Gym. It's nighttime. 
first money I get, I'm going to Miami. Why Miami? Miami needs new gigolos. Yeah, I read something like that. <laughs> I love this. This is one of the most odd conversations. Yeah. I didn't know what a gigolo was until I saw this. I was pretty young when I saw this movie. I was like seven or eight or something like that. Like, I didn't see it when it first came out in theaters either. Right, right. Like, What's a gigolo? What's he talking about? <laughs> yeah. But Polly would not be my first choice if I were a woman. <laughs> gigolo. So what's Polly talking about the money? Is he talking about the money he's going to get from Tommy still? What are you talking about? He's talking about going to Miami. He says the first thing he's going to do with his money is go to Miami. Oh, I think he means like once he gets some money. But where's he getting money from in this conversation? I think Polly's always scheming. He, I think he figures that they're going to find a way to get back on their feet again. I guess he's optimistic. Sure. Uh, I love how he's got the binoculars around his neck still. Yeah, I don't know what was what's with that. That's the flask. Isn't that the drinking? Oh, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. So that makes sense. So stupid. You just have a flask in your jacket pocket, but he's got binos, binoculars around his neck that he can open up and drink from. Yeah, Polly, Polly, Polly. I actually think Polly's okay in this movie. He's yeah. a little bit back down to earth. He's not quite the bumbling idiot in the snow of part four. Ah, yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. And honestly, when I was listening to the previous episodes, I actually don't think the loss of money is really Polly's fault at all. Mm-hmm. Uh, first of all, I don't know why they have Polly opening their mail. Maybe he just decided to do that. But that letter that the lawyer said it was a tax extension and then uh, Rocky signed it, Polly just told Rocky what was on the letter and Rocky signed it. I think if Rocky would have opened that letter, the outcome would have been exactly the same. Right. The only chance of that outcome not being like that is if Adrian opened the letter, which I would have assumed she w- should have. Like I don't know why what was going on there. Polly was had the wherewithal to keep the old house mm-hmm. in the neighborhood. Polly had the house. He lets them live in the house, and then he lives in that little apartment thing above the gym. Right. I, I don't think Polly, in reality, was that much of a buffoon or at fault in this movie. I, I wouldn't really expect him to be the one that should go read their mail and make sure everything's cool. Right. We talked a little bit about that. We like, were a little confused, but really, why did they even give that much authority to Polly? I don't think they gave any authority to Polly. I think Polly just opened a letter that said this. Like the accountant sent a letter to their house. Mm. Polly is going through their mail, opens it, and says, Hey, Rock, um, you need to sign this. But he probably thought he was helping or whatever, right? Okay. But if I were them, I would be like, Yeah, you don't open our mail. You can open your own mail. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was a perfect storm of mistakes. Yeah. If Polly didn't have that place, they'd be kind of screwed. Yeah, he kept the old place. He even says, aren't you happy I kept the old place? Isn't that smart of me? Yeah. Yeah, he's right. I'm giving Polly as a net positive in this movie, to be honest. Oh, wow. That's great. <laughs> it's not really at fault for the money thing. Like, I think that would have happened anyways. He basically provided them a way to, to survive financially once they got in the old neighborhood. So. Okay, I like hearing, not a different opinion, but just an expanded talk on Polly. Mm-hmm. And he does get kind of crapped on a lot. So it's good to hear a little bit of a positive talk on him. I got your back, Polly. You're going to be all right, bud. Polly's going to be a gigolo in Miami. All right, so now they're done their little banter. Ow! My back is getting bad. How come you don't have arthritis? Yo, ain't I got enough? So there's another little more banter there where Polly's back is going, and I guess he goes, ask Rocky, you know, why, why don't you have arthritis? And this is kind of a callback to Rocky 1. So yeah, Polly and Rocky were walking very similarly in the first movie. Think back to Polly's house for Thanksgiving, and Polly was complaining about his joints coming in and out of the freezer. Oh no, sorry. Were you talking about Rocky's back hurting in in the first movie? No, was uh, you... there was that mentioned on the same steps. Yeah, where Rocky tells Mike, "Hey, my my back hurts." Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And then Mike's like, uh, "Your back's hurting." <laughs> yeah, my back's hurting. Are you deaf? No, I'm short. <laughs> and then, but then the arthritis talk. You want to talk about that Ar- arthritis talk? Well, I just all I could think of was the joints part. Oh, okay, that's fine. I thought maybe you knew that Burt Young, uh, as an actor, he actually put turpentine on his joints during the filming of Rocky One, so he would uh, simulate arthritis. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. Yeah, I wonder if it worked. Well, he got an Oscar nomination out of it. 
Yeah. No, he was he was great in that film. Yeah, so I think it was turpentine or paint thin or something. So he actually put it on his joints. So they kind of stiff and ache. That's how, how he has a kind of saunter and the way he moves in Rocky 1. So I think there's a little bit of a callback there. Like, how, how come you don't have arthritis, he says to Rocky. I wonder if Burt Young, the actor, is remembering, I mean, it was only 15 years previous to this film, that he did that same that acting method or, yeah, method acting. That, he should have just punched one of those sides of beef a few times. Yeah. <laughs> that would make your joints hurt pretty good. Oh, yeah. Adrian's too good for this. So it's really depressing, Paul. You know it's... Yo, Rock, come inside. Everybody's been asking for you. You too, Paulie. <laughs> hey, no thanks. I'm a little big. Hey, I'm, I'm a little thirsty. Hey, you go if you want to, Paulie. Mr. Babo? All right, before we get into Tommy Gunn here, Rocky, of course, is still expressing to Pauly that this place is no good for his wife, Adrian. It's a dump. Then uh, he's got some locals inviting Rocky and Pauly in for a drink. And, of course, Pauly's thirsty. Yeah, he has his own drink, but why not have some more? And then outside, uh, Tommy Gunn waiting. So let's hear how Tommy Gunn – we just – on our last episode, we we heard what happened uh, or how it played out when he showed his stuff in the ring. Let's see if Tommy – can uh, change Rocky's mind with this uh, outside plea. Look at this, Tommy Gunn. Yo, why are you still hanging around, kid? Is there something I can do for you? Yeah, I'd like to try again. Hey, kid, you know, I'd like to help you out, but I really don't know nothing about no manager. Man, all I'm asking for is a chance. Man, if I screw up or do something you don't like, man, you, you don't have to throw me out. Hell, I'll leave. What have you got to lose? Me? Nothing, ain't got nothing. It's what you got to lose. I got nothing to lose. Yeah, maybe you do. Like, look, what if I don't do good, right? You know, and you don't make it. You, I, I, I don't want you blaming me for this kid, you know? All right, so the first argument that Rocky uses is, first he says, I don't want you to put your all your trust into me, and I'm just not cut out to be a manager. You're going to come around and blame me that your shot with me was a, was a waste. Yeah, I'm trying to think of what Rocky's really thinking here. He's obviously not confident in himself as a manager, and I'm trying to think why, because he obviously knows a lot about the fighting business. Yeah. But I think he's probably a little spooked from the situation because he probably feels a little responsible for whatever role he played in, in this whole financial mess that got them put back in his neighborhood. Right. So, he's, you know, he's probably lacking some confidence there, and, you know, he, he probably thinks he's done enough damage to people. You see him soften up a little here because now he's taking it off his shoulder saying, you know, I don't want to manage you. But now he's saying, well, eh, if I was to manage you, you know, what happens if I suck and you're going to get a little depressed about being a boxer? Yeah, it's kind of, you know, it's like when you buy something or do something, there's kind of a waiver. <laughs> yeah. This is Rocky's way of saying, look, you know, if I'm new, I don't really know what I'm doing with managing necessarily because I have no direct experience. So if I'm going to manage you, you basically have to do it at your own risk. Agreed. So let's see if Tommy changes his mind. I got nothing to lose, is what Tommy says. We'll go from there. Yeah, maybe you'll do. Like, look, what if I don't do good, right? You know, and you don't make it. You, I, I, I don't want you blaming me for this kid, you know. You know, here's what I would do if I was you. No, listen to me. If I was you, here's what I would do. I would go home. i talk to your family people. And maybe you can come up with something better, you know. I got no family people. Man, all I got is what you see here. Man, I know everything about you from back when, when you had your first fight with Apollo Creed. Yeah. I mean, I read how nobody cared about you, how no one ever gave you a chance. But I realize I don't come from the same streets as you do, but, but I'm hungry, like you were. Now, ever yeah. since I put on gloves, I've been waiting to meet you. Because I knew that if anybody could make me a winner, it was you. That's a pretty uh, soulful speech. You can see here Paulie's really digging it because he's seen the dollar signs. Yeah, yeah. yeah Paulie's he likes this guy. Probably sees a lot of Rocky in him. Tommy's doing a real good sales pitch here saying, look, you can't really screw me up because I'm basically at rock bottom anyways. And then the really good thing he does is it relates it back to Rocky himself saying, you know, I read how you were in a similar situation to me, although not the exact same. And no one gave you a chance. You know, all I'm asking for is this chance. Like you have nothing to lose. I, I'm at rock bottom anyways. I have nothing to lose. Like, let's do this. And I really like how he appealed to Rocky's personal situation. Polly, he sees this, and he, I think Polly sees that he's sold Rocky on this. I also love how Tommy refers to them as his family people as well. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Why do you go back and talk to your family people? And said, "Look, man, I, I don't have no family people." <laughs> yeah. Like you and I, if we had this conversation with Rocky, and Rocky had said, 
hey, why don't you go back to your family people, think of something better. I'd be like, uh, my family doesn't want to talk to me. I wouldn't say family people. <laughs> like It's almost like communicating in their native tongue. Yeah, I find sometimes people will do that either to relate to you or sometimes people will do it to really subtly make fun of you too. Right. They'll say it the wrong way just like you said it. But I don't think Tommy's doing that. I think he's just – I think he's trying to mimic <laughs> Rocky as much as he can here. Sure. Without without mocking. Hey, Paula. You see a winner standing there? Yes, and you beat the best. Nobody could ever say any different. Look, Rock, you don't know me. But anything you want me to do, I'll do. And if I can't, I'll bust my butt trying. Man, I'm not hustling you, man. All I'm asking for is a chance. Mm. And just one shot. Are you hungry? Yeah. Yeah? Come on. You really gonna like the way Adrian cooks, you know, she does it like amazing things with macaroni, especially tomatoes, but I gotta warn you, she can be a little vicious with the garlic. <laughs> He wins him over with pleading and begging, saying, look, give me, give me a shot, give me a shot. What do you got to lose? There was a line there that, oh, yeah, when he said, I'm not hustling you. Yeah. The Rocky has a bit of a change of heart and has that classic, instead of saying yes, you know, it's a good movie trope to say, are you hungry? <laughs> yeah. I think that what he said there, the, are you hungry, and then talk about Adrian and stuff, that's pretty in character for Rocky. It is, and I think it's a little bit of a foreshadow to the future Adrian's Diner. <laughs> Maybe. Maybe. I wonder if Rocky, after Adrian died, he finally got the layoff on the garlic. He's like, oh, it's, a, oh, it's about time I can stop with the garlic already, Adrian. Oh, yeah, he purposely just bought less garlic. Yep. <laughs> I wonder if in Adrian's Diner there's a macaroni dish with tomatoes and garlic. Uh, let's just assume there is. There has to be. There has to be. All right, so he's going to the house for supper. This is a big moment here. Which is kind of interesting, actually, because it's, I don't know about you, but if I just brought someone home for supper <laughs> yeah. without telling my wife about it, she'd be none too pleased with me, especially if it's a stranger that I just met on the street. Essentially, I know you saw him in the gym. As far as Adrian knows, he this guy's just some random person, right? Well, yeah. Imagine for a second you brought Tommy Gunn to your house. It's like literally that's what he is and that's what he looks like. Imagine you just brought him in your home. It's like, you're Adrian or this guy in the street just came to me and now I'm training him and he's going to be eating at our house. You know, like. We're going to see how this dinner plays out. So why this kid smack your face for, huh? It really doesn't so, matter, Dad. It does sure matter. matter. They, they, they took his coat. No. Look, yeah. I don't want the coat. They took the one with the collar. I'm going to go to your school tomorrow. And- They're sitting around the table. They're all eating their grub. And it starts off right away with uh, Rocky, the dad, asking Robert, hey, what happened to your face here? You got a shiner. Robert's trying to downplay. So, you know, I, they took my coat, but I didn't want it anyways. I understand that feeling. Like, you don't want to seem like you're in a really bad situation. Right. You're trying to you're trying to rationalize and minimize things. And, of course, Adrian, being the good mom's like, you know, I'm going to call the school tomorrow, which uh, we would do as a parent. I would. Your kid's got a shiner. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, it's funny. Even, like, when we were kids, I don't know what it was like for you, but, like, when I was in school, people got in fights fairly often. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And there wasn't that many consequences. Like, I've gotten lots of, well, lots. I've gotten quite a few fights in school. And you might get a detention or something like that. But nowadays, it's like if your kid gets in a fight in school – at least here, that's a huge deal. Like parents get called in, and like they take that pretty seriously. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, yeah. Well, there were a lot of fights growing up as well when I was calm. Kids would get into like fisticuffs and punch and wrestle, but you know, most, most of the kids can't punch that hard. Right, that's true. Yeah, I love how Rocky says, "Oh, you took the one with the color." <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that that almost reminds me of Rocky when when Adrian lost her hat. Yeah, same um, idea. He's like the detail. He gets fixated on some detail that doesn't really matter. Right. It's like, oh, where's your hat? Oh, is that the one with the collar? Yeah. Like, Rocky, yeah. we're not talking about, yes, the one with the collar or with the uh, thre- the 200 thread count or what. Like, all right. So I love how Polly, though, here in the dinner scene, he's the only one with the napkin. The slobbiest guy in the world, he actually is protecting his shirt with a napkin tucked in his neck. Have you ever eaten with a napkin in your neck like that? Never. And that's that's pretty bad for him. Have a napkin on your neck like that. <laughs> it's an adult bib. It's seriously an adult yeah. bib. I wouldn't be caught dead wearing a napkin around my, my neck. I think Paulie would be pantless if he could. Yeah, I'd be like the dad on that show Goldbergs. 
Goldberg's takes place in Philadelphia in the 80s. Oh. And whenever the dad comes home, he takes his pants off right away. <laughs> he like, never wears pants in the house. Paul would be that guy. And, of course, Tommy's just listening to this uh, family thing going on. I think Agent, if I remember correctly, Agent's going to get embarrassed by it all, but let's keep watching. Yeah, Look, you, you only should. make these words if you go, can I do what I think is right? Well, you know, what do you think is right? A baseball bat across the face of your night. Paulie. What are you telling this kid? Adrian, you got to play. Paulie, of course, old school, go back to that kid with the baseball bat. Here's the thing. I'm not advocating violence, but in a world where this kind of violence would be allowed, so to speak, that's how you deal with it. <laughs> oh, that's how I deal with it. If I was 14 again and some kid ripped my coat off, First, I would do everything to stop that from happening, yeah. but I wouldn't let that slide or else every, you're going to get ripped off every day. Yeah, so maybe not literally a baseball bat, but the idea is, uh, yeah, if he takes your jacket with one friend, you come back with three friends. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I, I know. It was the same when I was a kid, man. Like, We'll see how Robert deals with it later, actually. He kind of does something like that, as we know. So. <laughs> But to be fair, he doesn't use a baseball bat, but I, I don't want to talk about it now because it's going to come up later. But uh, how he deals with it, I think it's pretty cool. And I think it would even fly today, quite frankly. The thing is, is the coat's not going to be the only thing, right? That's right. What you brought up earlier is, yeah, if, if you're a target once, you'll be target twice. Yeah. Good. You know, I had trouble like that one time when I was in school. It seemed like every day I got chased by this one kid. Until one day my mother said to me, she said, uh, just pretend the guy's like a balloon. Balloon? She said, if you pop him hard, these guys just go away. <laughs> uh, Tommy, we're, we're trying to raise our son so he can handle his problems with his mind, not his muscles. Sorry. That's- All right. What do you think of that? Well, yeah, Adrian's kind of indicative of what we were talking about with kind of the way people are now. More enlightened, really. For 1990, this is 29 years ago. I mean, even when I saw this, when I was, again, I was 15... When I heard this, I agreed with Tommy and I agreed with Polly. Like I was still that. Totally. Yeah, hearing Agent talk about this, like, oh, no wonder Robert's kind of a. Right. To be real honest, there was a time machine. And I went back and I was my fourteen-year-old self, but with my mind now. If someone did something like that to me, and say I had the option to go to the principal or the teacher and get my coat back, I would almost do it not just to prevent future times of them doing it to me. But also for my own ego. Like, I don't know if I'd be able to really live with myself knowing that I allowed myself to get ripped off by those people. Sure. That's fair. So Rocky, he kind of liked what Tommy said there. Paulie really liked it. Yeah, so Adrian's alone here. As always, Adrian's opinion is not very popular. (laughs) Yeah, Adrian's a sensible one. Adrian got pushed around all the time, Paulie, and probably in school herself. She never had much of a body, so she always had to use her brain. Mm. And that's kind of what she's trying to teach her son here. Yeah. Robert doesn't have much, very many muscles, so he's got to use his mind. Yeah. Well, yeah, because Robert really takes after Adrian in a lot of ways. Like, mm. Even when you, you see him in Rocky Balboa, like he never took to fighting. He's kind of has that small, skinny build like Adrian. Like he, I think he is more like his mom than his dad, for sure. Well, just like Rocky said at the end of Rocky Five, when he put the cuffling to his ear, oh, you're the, like the daughter I always wanted. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, he's definitely not that macho man. And I say that as a joke, not making any kind of gender jokes here. I'm just saying that's what Rocky actually tells his kid in this movie, which they wouldn't write that today. They couldn't write that today. Put an earring on a kid, you can't say that. But in 1990, you could write that, and everyone chuckles in the theater. <laughs> well, yeah. And remember the uh, people would wear one earring? Guys would wear one earring. And everyone talked about the, the so-called gay ear. Yeah. The, no, one, no one agreed on what ear that really was. I'm not sure if they I think <laughs> I think if you had one piercing, it's weird. It's weird. If you had one piercing in the right ear, it means you're gay. In the left ear, it's okay to have one piercing in the left ear. I don't know. I've heard both. That's what I'm saying, right? Like, I don't know if anyway, I don't know if there's actually a universal standard on that. What a stupid rule. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no kidding. <laughs> What is it if you have a piercing on your nose? Yeah. Oh. yeah. Uh, Tommy, we're, we're trying to raise our son so he can handle his problems with his mind, not his muscles. Sorry. That's why I'm going to get mangled. Oh, you ain't going to get mangles. Dad, will you teach me how to fight? A baseball bat will be nice. Come on, do you want to grow up and just use your fists? A lot of things are happening here. So 
Paulie, I mean, he again brings up the baseball bat. And if you recall back to Rocky One, he did use a baseball bat when that's he was. That's what I was just going to say. That's his weapon of choice. <laughs> it is his weapon of choice. He's probably got one in this apartment somewhere. And that certainly would teach Chip or whatever that guy's name is a lesson. Oh, Chip would go down like a, yeah. And then Adrian says again, come on, do you mm-hmm. just want to grow up just using your fists? And Rocky's like, oh, yeah, easy. Whoa. Yeah, it's like my entire career and what uh, my whole identity is built on. Robert actually had a good little statement there where he's like, you know, I'm, we're raising Robert to use his mind, and that's why he said I'm going to get mangled. That's why I'm going to get mangled. Well, yeah, I'd be thinking that too, right? That's like you said, in those rules, in that environment. Let's say he had no physical ability whatsoever, and he had no choice but to use his mind. If you were to use your mind in that situation, you'd have to do something really manipulative or really bad in order to get your coat back. Right. It's not like you're at persuade Chip to give you your coat back. Like you're gonna have to like pay off some other guys to beat up Chip or whatever. Yeah, he'd be like the Joker. The Joker was a character that used his mind, or not his muscles. Yeah, that's right. Or Lex Luthor. Yeah. Dad, will you teach me how to fight? A baseball bat would be nice. Come on, do you want to grow up and just use your fists? Well, oh, Adrian, well, I don't think it'd be so bad if I taught him how to throw a few deadly punches. You know. Tommy, did your dad teach you to fight? I love how he says, if I taught him how to throw a few deadly punches. See, Rocky's not the salesman Tommy is, because by saying deadly punches, you're definitely, you just shut the door right there on uh, the prospect of teaching Robert how to fight, insinuating you'll teach him something that can kill another person, right? Like, he should have said something like, I could show him a few punches so he can defend himself and stay safe or something like that. (laughs) Yeah, that would have been a better, yeah. I could teach him how to defend himself, but only use these... This if he is uh, cornered or to defend himself, yeah, that would have been yeah. much. And I think Adrian would have agreed to that. Like, you know, can I teach him how to take a punch, how to block a punch? I don't think Rocky knows how to block a punch. <laughs> no, he knows how to take a punch. I don't think Robert has had the same ability of his father about taking punches. With a chin in boxing, you're born with a chin, or you're not. Yeah, I mean, Robert went down like a wet blanket, or what's the term? Like a or no, like a cement balloon. <laughs> Sure. <laughs> he got punched once and he went down hard. In general, hard, most people fall. Right. We got a story coming up here that will play all the way through. Robert's asked his father to teach, teach him how to fight, but his father hasn't really told him that he would uh, or he hasn't got permission from Adrian yet. And now Robert's gone to Tommy, the guest of the house, saying, Hey, did you ever, did your dad ever teach you how to fight? And here we go. It gets dark pretty quick. Fists? Well, Adrian, well, I don't think it'd be so bad if I taught him how to throw a few deadly punches, you know. Tommy, did your dad teach you to fight? Uh, no, not exactly. I had what? to... Come on, sweetheart, you don't get personal. No, it's okay. You see, my old man, he used to drink a lot, seriously. He'd go out with his friends and tie one on, then he'd come home and look to punch on me, you know. He'd punch on my mother, too. He did that a lot of times. You know, so growing up, I never really thought about fighting anybody but my father. You know, when I was 13, I, I got in trouble at school. He tied me down and he whipped me so bad I couldn't walk for a week. She couldn't do anything. <clears throat> but I tell you, the first guy I ever knocked out was my father. And uh, when I get in the ring, it's like uh, all I see is him. It's kind of sick, huh? Hey, old Tommy, at least you had an old man to knock out, you know? First, let's just talk about what Rocky said, and then we'll go back to what Tommy said. So Rocky indicates here that he didn't have a father growing up. Interesting. Very interesting. Because remember in the first movie, when Adrian first came to his apartment, mm-hmm. and he sits down on the couch, and she's still standing, and she's looking at the pictures. The oh, first one, oh yeah, the first picture she saw was Rocky's parents, and she asked, are these your parents? She's like, yeah, that's both of them. Yeah. <laughs> he must have some sort of affinity. His parents must have been together at some point that he can remember if he has a picture of them. Or you could argue, again, we're giving backstory here where none is given. You could argue that maybe his mother raised him, and the only yeah. picture he had of his mother was one next to his father. Or his father yeah. didn't Or his father didn't leave his family. Maybe his father died. Yeah, I was just thinking that too. Yeah, something could have happened to him. Yeah. Because remember Rocky was saying he grew up on like three square meals of zero a day? So right. maybe like his dad died or something, and then they – we're in the crappy neighborhood and they, you know, had a single mom trying to make ends meet or whatever. I think we cracked the code here, Kyle. I think Rocky was raised by a single mom. It's decided. That's what happened. Yeah. You've heard it here, folks, first. Rocky did not have a father growing up, but he had a father that he 
kept a picture of. So the father must have passed away when he was young. The mother raised him. Yeah. The only one who could dispute that would be Sly Stallone. And Sly, if you want to come on the podcast and do that, you're welcome anytime. Yeah, yeah, for sure. <laughs> And now let's go back to Tommy's story. Tommy Morrison here, the, the actor slash boxer in real life, he actually did a really good job delivering this. Um, oh, yeah. When he says that part, I got beat up so bad I, could, I couldn't do anything for a week and his voice cracks, it's it's quite well done. Yeah, it was very believable. I'm sure Trisha could put some light on that. I yeah. wonder what his real background was. I know. I don't want to assume, and if Trisha's listening, um, probably comment on the episode itself or maybe message me and I could talk about it on a future episode. But I, I, I wonder, I, even when I saw this back in the day, because the way Tommy delivers it, and artists will sometimes do that. They'll draw from personal experience to portray yeah. emotion. I kind of wonder what Tommy's upbringing was and how much of that story was something Sly inserted or Tommy ad-libbed or a bit of both where, you know, Sly said, hey, do you got anything in your past life that we can talk about here? Also, like, they got a real gem here with Tommy Morrison. They have a real fighter. So in the fighting scenes, he actually knows how to fight. Mm -hmm. But he can actually act pretty good, too. He really gets crapped on. And after watching this movie again for this show, I mean, I've seen it many times, but watching it again to review on, on season five, I don't know why. It might have been because you and you were talking to um, the gentleman who played George Washington Duke. Richard Gant. Yeah. When you were talking to him about who's the villain here in this movie, a lot of people thought it was Tommy. In reality, it's not. In reality, it's the Duke character. I think what might give Tommy a bad rap is that he's kind of like, if people see him as the villain, then he's kind of a lukewarm villain, right? Like he's not that good at a, as a villain in this case. And so mm. you might not like his performance because of that. Yeah, I see that. Yeah, I agree. And I agree with Richard Gant that the true villain is the, what do you call it? The emperor Palpatine. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Anakin was uh, seduced by the dark side, but if the Emperor never existed, you could argue Darth Vader never would have existed. Yeah, that's right. As you'll see in the film, Tommy here, he's young, he's inexperienced, and he's uh, susceptible to manipulation. Yeah, exactly. I love how this dinner kind of ends awkwardly, but Polly just keeps eating, kind of raises, you know, just kind of shrugs and says, well, there you go. There you have it. And just keeps eating his food. <laughs> Polly has one of those unique characteristics where he just doesn't care. Yeah, it's admirable. Mm. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Honestly, because it's, we care so much about what other people think and about stuff in our lives. And sometimes we could use, probably not be so tactless as Polly, but kind of just let things go like he does. Right. Now, when I get in the ring, it's like uh, all I see is him. It's kind of sick, huh? Hey, old Tommy, at least you had an old man to knock out, you know? Yeah. Oh, didn't even have that, you know? Yeah, someday you can punch out your pup. Hey, yo, Paul, what are you telling the kid things like this? Hey, it's the fittest of the survival. It's the fittest of the survival. I don't know if you watch the show Trailer Park Boys. No. There's a character, Ricky, he always messes up phrases. Uh -huh. Like, he'd be like, oh, that's supply and command. <laughs> or you know, stuff like that. I really... There's been any Trailer Park Boy fans on the, the show. Oh, I'm sure what? there is. And you know what? The old uh, Sylvester Stallone's writing to that. Yeah, exactly. Hey, also, you, you see inside the house, really, for the first time. The table fits five of them. That's not bad. Look at the cupboards in the background. Ugh. Like, they look dirty. Like, they look nasty. Like, you can kind of see, like, how kind of far down they really come. Agent's got some work to do in the kitchen. <laughs> yeah. Did Paul have renters in that place, I wonder? Like, was it vacant forever? Well, remember he got mad at Rocky and Rocky Three. They never asked. He goes, do you move Mickey in? You know, he didn't move Paul in. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And then he eventually moved Polly in. Was he moved in in part four? He, yeah, I'm pretty sure. Well, I'm pretty sure he moved in in part three later on, like when he's hanging out with like the, maybe they just had him over to babysit. The yeah, that's the only thing I got was that he he was there a lot. I didn't get the impression he lived there. But then again, maybe that's why he got the mail. Yeah. By the time Rocky Five rolled around, he for sure was living there. Or else Polly would be like, you can live with me. The idea of him keeping the old place implies that he could have not kept it, which wouldn't have made sense if, if he was living there. I'm guessing Rocky Four is when he moved in and started, you know, sponging off them or whatever. <laughs> All right. Well, that ends today's discussion. We didn't get through too many scenes, which is fine. There was a lot going on here. There's a lot to talk about. 
I'm really liking Rocky Five now that I'm watching it like this again. Yeah, I'm the same way. I find watching it like this, it's like a little family drama broken up in little 10, 15 minute increments. It's, there's a lot going on. Rocky Five ages well. When you first had it, it wasn't good. But then, you know, after a while, after a while, it, it's pretty good. It's true. People might not have liked it day one. Fine. I would challenge people, go back and reinvestigate this film. It has actually aged better as a film than 3 and 4. We've said this a million times. 3 and 4 are fun movies, but they haven't aged <laughs> quite the same way uh, they look like and feel like in 1980s movies. This Rocky Five doesn't feel like a 90s movie other than some of the soundtrack songs. In the Rocky 3 and 4 were very one-dimensional. Mm-hmm. There was like the main plot of Rocky having to beat the antagonist, and there was like a couple subplots. But like, I find Rocky Five is pretty rich. There's a lot going on. Here. There is a lot going on. You got the kid getting bullied at school. You got Tommy coming in. You got Paulie and his issues. You got Richard Duke, sorry, uh, George Washington Duke, played by Richard Kent. Adrian, her issues trying to juggle her father and her son. I can't wait to talk about Adrian's scene later in the film. There's a lot going on. It's a full, full movie, rich movie. Glad we're not flying through each scene because there's a lot to talk about in each scene. You know, we might have to re-review the first couple films. I thought about that. I actually thought out of my mind there, Kyle. And I actually thought about that and having a guest host on for that as well. Not that, not to have Ruben out of the show because that's not true at all. Again, for our listeners, now that I'm going to be living across country, Ruben and I won't be able to record together in the same room. So we're going to have to do these uh, non-live recordings. But as time goes on, it's just hard for us to, because we're now in different time zones like to boot, which is, you know makes it harder because like when he's ready to court at like say seven or eight o'clock at night like we used to it's gonna be 10 or 11 o'clock at night for me um yeah kind of sucks but we'll get through it. anyways that being said uh i have thought about kind of like reduxing as because i've grown as a podcaster and as the show grows going back and maybe kind of redoing maybe at least one and two kind of revisiting those two maybe because i think three and four we hit a stride as a podcast but it might be kind of fun to revisit or even just do like two or three episodes per movie or something. I don't know. We'll think of something. I always think of something, Stallion. <laughs> you know me. <laughs> All right, Kyle, is there anything you want to plug? or? <laughs> no, no. Just keep on punching, Ryan. Kyle, or one of our few guest hosts who has absolutely nothing in his life worth plugging. <laughs> I don't know how to take that. I'm just going to say okay. <laughs> I mean, yeah, it was a compliment. It was a backhanded compliment. I love it. <laughs> Kyle has nothing worthwhile in his life that you should go check out. <laughs> there is absolutely nothing in his life that you guys need to even look at. <laughs> Anyways, thanks, Kyle, for coming on the show. I, I, you're welcome, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> All right, brother. We'll talk to you soon. Thanks again. All right. Hey, take care. Do you want to take us out? We forgot to do it last time. Oh, yeah. Ding, ding. Thank you, brother. See ya.